uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be talking here uh, on, on a pre-talk for the second International Nano Nanobioengineering Congress. So the idea is that I'll be talking about combining biological uh, modeling with machine learning. So I'll be giving lots of, I'll be talking about lots of different topics, uh, lots of different research area in which is in which my, my group focuses uh, but it's to give a bit of a flavor and obviously there's lots more here uh, yeah but the idea is to give a, a broad overview so my group is the group of optimization and machine learning for process systems engineering and these are the nine main areas that we focus and today I'm going to be talking different topics that are interrelated uh, but that mainly cover this the this uh, five areas that I'm outlining, and particularly, obviously, on sustainable production uh, on processes. So before I start the talk, I want to mention that there's many people, of course, working in many of these topics. Most of my my most of the work that I'm going to be highlighted, or practically all the work that I'm going to be highlighted, was done obviously by my group, and the citations there are going to be biased towards my own work. But of course, there's many other people who who have contributed to this area uh, and, and lots of still lots of work. All right, so let me just start with this laser pointer. So just a brief outline of the talk is I'll first be talking about modeling and optimization bioprocesses. And initially I'm going to be talking about the traditional way in which we do this. Uh, well, traditional, I mean still model based, so using computational techniques, but not yet doing machine learning. And I just I want to highlight that although machine learning gets all the hype, of course, traditional modeling and optimization is super important and it's still at the key and at the center of what should be done. And then I'm going to be talking about the so the main part of the talk will cover on how do we actually use machine learning and embed these techniques into bioprocess modeling and optimization. All right, so first I'll give a very quick introduction. Obviously, this, this is just a bit of the motivation. Uh, which is that we know that traditional energy and raw material sources that come from petroleum or from limited resources that, that, that are very contaminated, they're they're non-renewable, and of course they they have they have they're causing great uh, harm to the environment. Yeah, and even if we wanted to continue doing this, they're non-renewable anyway. So we're looking for ways to to get new not only fuels but also raw material. So like bioplastics and biopolymers. And so the new alternative here is biofuels and bioproducts of third and fourth generations. Yeah, and the idea of biofuels is that these are generated by microorganisms. They do not compete for farmland and they can use CO2 and solar energy. Uh, so they're a, way, a clean, clean way to create an energy, electricity, and also, again, bioproducts. And so now I'm going to be talking about um, how would you use computational tools uh, or what are the, what's the main idea behind using computational tools for bioprocess optimization and, and modeling and, and so on. So basically first, how could we produce energy or bioproducts using cyanobacteria or microalgae? Yeah, so what's the big picture idea? So first you might think that you, we have some kind of culture there so some microalgae swimming in, in some kind of solution and we put them inside a flask. The only thing is that this flask, we're just going to call it bioreactor or photobioreactor in many cases if we also give light to it. And the idea is that we want to uh, give temperature, nutrients and light such that our bacteria can produce uh, as much of the product that we want as, as we can. Yeah, and this in terms, again, if we feed it enough, it gives us energy, bioproducts, and, and so on. And what I want to highlight this, and probably the most important slide so far, is that these have very low productivity, and most of them are not yet economically viable. So the problem here is that, and, and again, this is a whole field of study, but I'm just going to oversimplify it by saying the bacteria or micro well, you generally don't like to produce stuff for us humans, right? So we have to form, and this makes the productivity be very low. And what my talk is going to be about is how to actually make these processes more efficient through computational tools in an 
effort, and this is a combined effort because there's efforts in many other parts of this, uh, to try to make them economically viable, and then again to have clean uh, fuels and, uh, and products. So what's so first of all, why do we need mathematical model? Yeah, so so again, mathematical modeling. What I'm referring to is that we have some reactor uh, with with some bio uh, some microorganisms there, and we want what we want to do is we want to represent that with mathematics. Yeah, and and what can this modeling do for us? So one thing that it can do for us, and this is this is sometimes I think overlooked, is that it can create. Not, not not create, but it can help us gather new knowledge and understanding about the system. So obviously there's lots of experimental work and this is mainly done by experiments. But generally when you actually create mathematical models and then you're able to explain the parameters inside these models, you're actually able to better understand the microorganisms, how they take light into account, how they take carbon or nitrogen sources, which can be thought of as some kind of nutrient, and how also cell decay. Uh, with time. So mathematical models not only help us predict what what these things do, but they also help us analyze the systems. And one of the things that they help us do is they use uh, they help us do experimental design. So as, as you might expect, doing experiments with bioprocesses is not only very very but also very time consuming, right? And for every experiment that goes right, there might be several that go wrong. And models can also help us design the least amount of experiments that we that we need so that we can get uh, a lot of information from them and actually this saves us a lot of resources uh, both money and, and time another thing that you can imagine is fast prototype yeah so instead of for example doing one experiment with different conditions our microalgae or, or or bacteria and having them do different conditions different light intensity, different amount of nutrient and temperature to see which one produces the most. If we're able to abstract this information mathematically, then we can quickly do simulations uh, to test out different environments. And then again, we're not wasting time uh, and resources and, and, and mathematical modeling is, is, is the key tool why this is useful. And then after that, which is uh, a lot of a lot of what I do is once you have a mathematical model you can actually do what's called process optimization yeah so you can make this process more efficient by applying specific algorithms to your models that already represent your reality then there's a lot of talk of biorefinery so so most people or many people believe that bioprocesses should be done in biorefineries which is where actually you have many different kind of products being produced at the same time and they synergize and obviously to do by a refinery planning uh, modeling is, is paramount. It's the, it's the main tool that is done today, also with traditional chemical processes. And also to develop mutant species. Yeah. So, so, so many times what you want to have is specific bacteria. You want to maybe change some of the metabolic pathways, inhibit some so that you can get more, maybe make a bacteria that can produce more a specific type of, type of bioproduct that you want. And modeling is also very, very, very efficient in this. It, it's obviously a combination effort between experiments and model, but it can help a lot in this. All right, so first I'll be talking about what I call the empirical and mechanistic biological modeling. So this is using biological knowledge and information to create a model. So before this, uh, for those that are experts in, in, in modeling, whenever I create a model, I like to remind myself of two things things and this goes in the in, in the direction of complexity versus utility and there's two big phrases about this that i like uh i feel i feel yeah this is a bit in, like like inspirational quotes but i think they actually are very useful one of them is that all models are wrong but some are useful and this means that any model that you create there's going to be some range of conditions for which it's not going to be valid and actually it's more that for only some range of conditions it's going to be valid so you want to create a very accurate model in the range that you want to use it, but also be wary that there's places where your model is not going to be valid. And make sure that when you're using this for optimization, for experimental design, uh, you take this into account. And the second one is everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And the idea here is, again, you can have a very, very complex model, but then it's very difficult to draw inference on, on it. You maybe have to 
and lots of time developing it. So try to make the simplest model that actually does the work. And this, uh, these are two, I think, two highlights that are sometimes overlooked. All right. So then how would you create an empirical or mechanistic model? Well, what you would do is you would go with your experimental collaborators and they would help you analyze the system so that, for example, you, you, create, you have a time series where you create biomass and nutrients and bioproducts. Yeah. And then you do several experiments on this. And most bioprocesses, by the way, work on dynamic behavior. So this means that this is a time series. And you analyze the effects of light intensity and temperature and you get this all, all this data, right? And then what you do is based on biological model, you build a dynamic model. So this is a system of differential equations uh, that's able to represent what's happening in your, your bioprocess. And then what you do is you want to validate that this model is actually predicting uh, what's happening in your system, right? So the, the, the aim of a model is for it to be able to reproduce a real system. So here the red dots, this is just an example, but the red dots are experimental data and the, the line is our model. So once you build the model, you, also, you actually want to see that it's actually capturing what's happening in reality. Yeah. And so the idea is that you would first again build this, uh, this model and validate it, and then you would want to do optimization. So once you have this system of equations that represents your, your system, then you can actually say, okay, what are the conditions of temperature, light, nutrient, um, and all of this that maximizes my production? Because since these are dynamic uh, systems, most of the time you're not going to be able to keep, so to, to get the maximum production, it's not like you get light just one single value for the seven days that your bioprocess lasts. You actually have to change light and have a product, a, a, a profile. And the same for nutrient. You might need to give a lot of nutrient at the beginning and then not give enough. So this is not a super simple problem. And this is the way that we're going to be able to drive productivity upwards. So again, creating a model and then optimizing it. And so how this would work in practice, and this is an area that we've been working on, which is automating control and optimization, is a technique that's called economic model prediction predictive control, and you have your biosystem, then you have some bioprocess model. So you will take a sample from your biosystem. You would you, you would refine your model, right? So once you take a new measurement from your system, you want to refit your model a bit because bioprocesses are very difficult to predict. So you want to you, you wanna probably re-estimate some of the parameters. Then you want to do process optimization. So you want to tell the, your, your, your model at this time instance, what is the best light, nutrient, and, and temperature that I need to give to my biosystem? And then you feed it back. And then you let a few hours pass. And again, you probably want to grab a, a, another sample for your biosystem, refine your model a bit, and again, do this loop of modeling, optimizing, and so on. And this was called model predictive control. And this is what has started to be done in, in, in parts of industry. Now, this is a, again, this is a very, very useful technique and it's shown lots of nice results. Some of the results, for example, that we've had is that we've incremented the production of biohydrogen. Uh, so so we, we did some, some research on using it for biofuel. We've managed to scale up um, the production of L-tryptophan. So again, scaling up also what you want to do is you, you start from a flask, uh, like a very small bioreactor, and then you want to do it to industrial scale. So we managed to use modeling this kind of, of processes and scaling up. And also we managed to, to increase uh, phycosanin, which is a high value byproduct. So this means that you can actually apply these methods and you can get very nice results uh, that are actually very useful in practice. Now, the problem here is that there is lots of work to be done. Uh, and although again, this work and it's better than doing nothing, there's still lots of room for improvement. Your bullet points is that it's practically impossible to create 100% biological models. So I won't talk a lot about this, but the idea is that generally when you create dynamic models or kinetic models, your parameters are basically a single number. So a single parameter actually stands for maybe hundreds or thousands of metabolic pathways. So generally what you're doing is actually using just some kind of data-driven model uh, combined with some biological knowledge, but this is not 100% biological models. Then your 
predictive power is very limited. Um, so like I show here, and I just try to illustrate this with this image, is that, for example, even though this process seems to start at the same initial condition, your same, pro probably if you put three reactors, three bio reactors, they will actually have different yields. So it's very difficult actually to predict what this is going to do. Uh, and this is a problem of mathematical modeling. Uh, uh, then of course that for every model that you develop, you need to, in, you need to use a lot of, uh, there's lots of research behind it of understanding the, the biological system. So let's, let's say lots of biological theory behind it and lots of experimental work, of course. And finally that, biological systems, or the, although they're not intrinsically, intrinsically stochastic, so it's not like quantum mechanics, but macroscopically, so from a macroscopic, macroscopic point of view, they're, they're, they're stochastic and even chaotic, in the sense that from the same initial condition, uh, your bioprocess bio might, might end up in very different places. And, and this makes it very challenging. And so this is where machine learning comes up, and this is where I think that there's an opportunity to to embed machine learning techniques into bioprocess model. And so the main idea of, of machine learning is that you have some kind of model. So we call them black box models because machine learning models, we don't know what's happening inside. So with biological models, and this is one of the things that I had alluded at the beginning, is that you actually can understand each term in the equation, what is it doing, right? So some of them are for the absorption of nutrient, some of them are for for telling us how, how light affects it. But when you use machine learning, you have no idea about this. I mean, there's a lot of research in this in this, in this this way, in what they call interpretable machine learning, but this is at very early stages. And, and it's not really going to catch up with real empirical model. Yeah, so you have some model, which is a black box, which simply giving some inputs to represent your outputs. And there's many common uh, models. And here I'm just highlighting some of them, which are Gaussian process, neural network, decision trees and support vector machines. And this is these are the main ones that I use uh, in, in my research. Yeah, and again, there's many others, but, but these are the main and, and what we use mostly is what's called supervised learning in machine learning. And the first thing that I want to highlight when using machine learning in bioprocesses is that I think the biggest advantage is not in using just pure machine learning models, but actually using what we call hybrid modeling which is combining knowledge-based model, which is what I call mechanistic or empirical uh, with biological knowledge, and to that adding some machine learning uh, model on top of it. So there's several categories of hybrid models, but this is the one that I like more, uh, more that, that I like more uh, using. And this is that there's, first there's the series configuration where you have a data-driven model that uh, then inserts into a biological model and that creates a hybrid model. Or you have biological models that then insert into a hybrid model, into a, a machine learning model, sorry, and then that becomes a hybrid model. And for those interested, so this is probably one of my few references that is not on, that is not, that is not mine, but this paper is a very nice review paper that actually talks about hybrid modeling. Uh, so, so for anyone who's interested in hybrid modeling in bioprocess, I definitely suggest uh, going to see that, that paper. And so what am I talking here? So for example, some of the series configuration could be trying to embed metabolic reaction into biological models. So biological models, again, many times you have many parameters that are a single number, and they actually represent many biological pathways. So one thing you can do is instead of that biological parameter, instead of being a single parameter, that can be a whole metabolic pathway. And this can be done by embedding maybe, maybe having some uh, neural network, be able to represent the metabolic pathway and then embedding the neural network into your kinetic model. This is actually an area that we're rich, researching currently. Uh, we still don't know the results, we're still working on it, but it, it looks promising. Then the other series configuration, for example, is that you have some biological model and then actually you insert the biological model in, into a data-driven model. And in this case, what we've done is the same thing. So we have our kinetic model. And if you've worked on this, you know that, for example, computational fluid dynamics, so CFD stands for computational fluid dynamics. Uh, so this is very, so combining 
a kinetic model with solving the equations of Navier Stokes is super difficult. Uh, uh, and your simulations might take in the order of many hours to days, even in supercomputers. So one thing that we've been doing is actually we embed uh, biological information into them and pass that in into a neural network. And we've had some promising results uh, that, that you can see in this paper if you're interested. But this is the way that we again use hybrid model in, in, in series. And now another type of hybrid model that I like is what are called parallel configurations, where actually both models feed, let's say you just add both these models. So instead, instead of inserting one model into the other, here you're adding both models and then by adding them, you're creating a hybrid model. And the main type of model that I like about this is what we call discrepancy models. So discrepancy models are a kind of, of, of a hybrid parallel model where the idea is that you try to model your reality using biological information as best as you can, right? But as, as we know, and this is something that is going to be recurrent, all our models are going to be wrong. So this is our imperfect model. And then what we try to do is we try to our discrepancy. So the difference between our reality and our model, we're going to use a machine learning component to be able to model this. And then by adding them together, we're going to have a very precise model. So you can think of it, for example, as, as friction in mechanical experiment, yeah? So, so for example, if you want to model some kind of pendulum or even a car, the aerodynamics of a car, they're not super complicated. What's super complicated is to add the, the, the friction. Yeah, that, that is a very complex phenomenon. And then what you do is that basically you can just model them with the normal mechanical equations, and then you measure your experiment, you measure what your model is going to say, and then that difference is a data point. And then at the end, you try to use all those data points to fit some machine learning model, and then you're able to get a very accurate model. And again, in mechanical in mechanical systems, this can be friction. In chemical reactions, this can be intermediate reactions. In bioprocesses or biochemical processes, transport, fen transport phenomena, which are super difficult to model. And many times in big industrial systems, they can be like disturbances, after from the outside, from the environment, from fluid dynamics. And again, this is just some picture of, of, of how this would look like. So you could have a kinetic model and you would have data a bit different. And this, what we call plant model mismatch, this is what your discrepancy model will actually look. And an area where we've used this is in real time optimization. So what we've actually done is we've used this discrepancy model and actually applied it in the concept of what's called real-time optimization, which I'm going to talk briefly about it. So when you want to optimize uh, any chemical processes, but particularly in this case by the processes, let's assume that you have some starting point over here and you want to get to your, to your real systems. Yeah? And then you have a model where you're trying to represent your system, which gives you a slightly wrong optimal over here. Now, the first thing that I want to mention is that if you've ever done modeling and then optimization, do you know that when your model is wrong, then when you use optimization on top of that, you actually your models, your errors amplify, right? Because your optimizer is going to look for those little errors and it's going to magnify them such that it takes advantage of them. But this is not the reality, right? So you will start at some starting point and what will happen is that you will get to some wrong model optimal. And the idea is that what we want to do and what we do is we use optimization algorithms that actually take intermediate samples and by using machine learning, we notice that we're going in the wrong path and we we we, we redirect onto the models through optimal. So now I'm talking about a topic that's a bit different, which is real-time optimization, which is again, this thing where you have to make decisions in real time and your models are like all models, they're wrong. They don't exactly represent reality. So how would you do some uh, traditional real-time optimization? And this is called the two-step approach. So assume you have a system of equations, yeah, which would, you're representing your reality. And you have what are called para parameters. Yeah, so these parameters, you generally get experimental data and you, you fit them to your model. Yeah, so you have this, this parameters over here. Then what you would generally do is you were you would get so you would you start at this 
point again, and you gather experimental data. Yeah. And then you do what's called parameter re-estimation, which means that given your ongoing process and given the data that you've collected, you estimate your parameters of your model again so that you can better represent reality. Yeah? And then once that you have a refined model, then you take one optimization step to try to optimize your system. And then this model, this point, you again include it into your data set and you re-estimate your parameters to create again a better model to represent what's happening in reality. You take again another optimization step to try to go to the real optimum. You include the point into your, your model. You do another optimization step. You include that, that point to your model and so on and so forth until you reach the end. And what you will see is that even if you do this parameter re-optimization, this is something that's not obvious and that not many people know it, but you actually will not get to your to your real optimum as long as you have what's called structural plant model mismatch which means that your model is not perfectly correct it means that if, if the structure of your model is not perfectly correct you will not get to the real optimum and this is something that will always happen yeah and uh, and then here is where what we do is we use machine learning um so what we do is we add this machine learning component into our algorithm and this is what i'm showing here so that for example we have a starting point over here and our model shows us that this is the the correct optimum but by sampling at every step when we include a machine learning component in a hybrid model way we're actually able to get to our true optimum and just a nice side effect that i want to show in the image here on the left is that here we have what are called a constraint so we actually don't want to go beyond this line. And uh, this is very important in engineering applications. In bioprocesses, it is important, but also in many other engineering, where there are constraints like temperature or quality that you don't want to you don't want to violate. And are very, very, very well able to capture this. And again, this is done by using hybrid models, by merging machine learning and our empirical models. All right. So that was a quick detour into real-time optimization. And now I'm going to be talking about what's called discovery of equation, which is another way where you can use machine learning uh, in, 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 in the context of bioprocesses. And the idea here is that when I propose a model, it's very difficult. Again, again, you have to study a lot of what is the correct model. Yes, yeah, so, so what is the, the correct model that represents my reality? But that also has to have biological knowledge embedded into it, right? This is very important for for, uh, for modeling bioprocesses. So what I actually do is that I, I use a machine learning algorithm that, uh, that is actually able to identify which are the correct terms that, that I should be using, or that given my data, which are the most probable terms. This, this is all using a lot of statistics uh, and what's called maximum likelihood to determine which are the most probable terms that describe my system. Um, and again, I, I'm going into, into too many details here, but basically that you have uh, some kinetic equations and you're going to be able to determine, given given a mismatch, which is your, your, your best model. And what we're basically doing, for those who, who are familiar, is, is we're applying optimization and we're applying what are called decision trees. But again, the main idea and the main takeaway of this is that machine learning, we're not only using machine learning and throwing it at our bioprocess, we're actually applying machine learning and biological knowledge combined to come up with the best model that actually represents my reality. And then, I'm, yeah, so, so that was one topic. Now I'm going to talk about deep learning models. Yeah, so deep learning, is, is it, there's a lot of hype around it, but the truth is deep learning works very well when you have lots of data. And as, as I've talked about, and probably you, you can imagine, in bioprocesses, we don't have a lot of data, and actually a lot of data is very expensive to come by. So it is a very useful technique, and the AI community has come with very nice algorithms, but we actually have to tailor them to be useful in engineering applications, particularly in bioprocesses. So one way is we developed a specific model which is called a neural, we, we, we developed a, what's called a recurrent neural network 
uh, and we use that to predict dynamical systems in bioprocesses. So basically, we defined a specific structure of our neural network so that we could actually, what we did is we gave it input data. So we gave it uh, data from experiments and we asked and we trained it so that it could actually uh, determine how our dynamical systems or how our actual bioprocesses look like. And we, we have a few papers on how you have to do this, but the main takeaway is that you cannot just throw a neural network into a bioprocess and hope that it works. You actually have to understand how bioprocesses work and uh, and make a few a few tweaks and tunings here and there, and they, and they can be actually quite useful. And then a nice thing that we can do is that once you have a deep learning model, so basically this deep learning model is, is very similar to the differential equations that I showed initially, but because deep learning models are what are called multimodal, which means that when you try to optimize them, they have many, many minima. This is not an easy problem to solve, and we use what are called evolutionary optimization algorithms, which if you're starting in the, in the area of optimization, they're quite are nice algorithms to play around with because uh, they have like this nice and fancy component where you start with lots of particles, and by using uh, something that resembles a lot like Darwin's evolutionary you're able to get to, to the optimum of the system. And you would do it in the same manner as I mentioned before, where you have your real system, you would sample for it from it, you would refine your deep learning model, you would optimize it, you would input the best light, temperature, and nutrient um, for some time, and then again resample and so on and so forth. And we actually did a very nice experiment where we, we, we used just a pilot plant, so a pilot plant photobioreactor, and we were able to optimize it, including the effects both of fluid dynamics, but also of, uh, of a kinetic model. And this is what I'm showing here. So basically I had a pilot photobioreactor. We included both the scale of the kinetic model, but also the computation of fluid dynamics. The image recognition from deep learning to be able to extract the velocity vectors from the computational fluid dynamic component and add them onto the, the, the kinetic or biological component. And then we used an evolutionary algorithm to optimize it. And again, we use this in, into a design loop. And we managed to get quite nice results with this. Um, so now another area that is, again, I'm jumping topics. So the idea here is, is I talk about uh, a few topics with not in great detail, but giving like the highlights and another I think very important uh, model is what are called Gaussian processes. So deep neural networks or deep learning has gotten a lot of hype and lots of the fame, but actually from probably, particularly in, in the academic community, maybe from five, five years to now, these Gaussian processes have also gotten a lot of attention because they work with very, very, very few amount of data. And again, this is very important in engineering applications when you do have you don't have millions or billions of data points. And the idea is that we can also build models with this, where we grab experimental data. We construct what are called Gaussian processes, which you can think of them as, again, without going too, into too much detail, you can think of Gaussian processes as neural networks, but that they also give you uh, the error. So the model will not only tell you, I think this is the value that you'll get in this prediction, but I will also tell you how, what's the uncertainty on it. And this is very important in engineering applications, right? Because you want to actually know uh, what's the uncertainty on any prediction of any model. Then you create something that's called state space models, and then you optimize them using, again, model predictive techniques that I've shown before. And these algorithms are particularly good because they have statistical guarantees. That's why I like to call them statistical modeling. They're very good for, co for modeling complex biochemical processes because, again, they tell you where they can go wrong and then tell you their uncertainty. They're very robust in constraint violations, which this is very important. This is not super important, although it is important in bioprocesses. It's also very important in other chemical uh, processes where actually you can have very high temperatures or you can have exploding reactors or runaways and so on. And they're also very efficient in online learning. So this means that you need to collect less data than if you were using, for example, deep learning. And then the idea in, 
in the same way as this economic model predictive control strategy that I talked about, where you have a biosystem, you sample from it, you refine your model, you optimize it, and you go on. But most importantly, I think what you want to do is use them as, as I mentioned, in a hybrid model, where you actually use your biological knowledge to derive the model, and then you use maybe the Gaussian process as some kind of discrepancy model. Uh, where this can model the part that is difficult uh, from, from the pure biological understanding. And finally, I'm going to get to the to the last part of my talk, which is reinforcement learning in bioprocesses. And this is uh, quite a, a hot area of research and one that I like, like a lot. Um, but this is again, this is still just ongoing research. So first I'll be talking about what is reinforcement learning. So if you've seen computers that can play games. This is the main takeaway of what reinforcement learning can do. And the little story that I tell, uh, what, what I tell while I explain this is, for example, uh, uh, when Gary Kasparov, so he was the best chess player in the world, was playing against Deep Blue, which was an IBM computer. And the idea is that back then they called Deep Blue uh, an AI, an artificial intelligence computer. And this would not be called AI right now, but back then they called it this way. And the idea was that IBM engineers uh, gave the computer very detailed instructions in the form of if-else statements. Yeah, so that means they would they would tell uh, Deep Blue, which was the computer, you know, if you move your if, if Casper moves his uh, his pawn in this way, you move it in that way. Or if he if he starts moving the queen and puts it in this direction, you move it this way, and so on. And the idea is that the final score was one to one. And we know that chess is a difficult game, right? But it's not incredible difficult, not incredibly difficult for a machine, right? So machines should be able to do better. And this eventually happened when AlphaGo, which was the computer of of DeepMind, play against uh, Lisa Doll, right? And the main takeaway is that Go is a much more complex game than chess. Just to give a, a brief idea, the idea of Go is that you actually have to surround your opponent's uh, pieces, which is a much more abstract thing th than playing chess. And the idea is that playing this game is much more difficult. Yeah, And it happened that AlphaGo, a few years later than Deep Blue, so Deep Blue only managed to tie with Kasparov, but AlphaGo actually managed to defeat Lisedol 4-1. to but not only that, after it played with Lisedal, which was one of the best players in the world, it learned from the, from him, and later it was able to defeat the number one player in the world, three to zero. Yeah, so so it actually improved significantly. Then after that, it defeated six player, the six best players in the world combined. So they would get the six best players in a room, they would decide which move they would do together, and then AlphaGo would move, and it was all, it also defeat them without them winning any match. And after that, an even more intelligent computer, which called AlphaGo Zero, defeated AlphaGo 100 to zero. Yeah, so by this, the, by this computers just completely outmatched any possible human player. And the idea is, how did they do this? So different to 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 when when Deep Blue was was trained, when humans actually told them what to do. In this case, what happened was that uh, AlphaGo was actually fed with the with the with the way that the best players in the world played, yeah? So it would take, for example, a snapshot of a, of a board at some position, and then what the board looked at the next position. And this would, basically, it was getting the knowledge of all the best human players in the world. And later it did something that was even, even better, right? So that no other human player could ever do. And it was, it was asked to play itself millions of times. And so in this way, it was able to, to, to become much better than any humor player could ever ever dream to become. And so after, obviously, obviously this is super fancy and, and lots of hype around it, but then we said, OK, can we actually use it for bioprocess control? So what we did was we used our current model predictive control or our very good controllers, and we fed our neural network uh, th this controller. So it would abstract no knowledge so far. Then what we did was we built a specific structure which is called the policy gradient recurrent neural networks. 
network, the, the details are not very important, but basically we fed this expert knowledge into the network. And then inside a simulated environment, we asked it basically to play against itself many times so that it would get even better at optimizing by a process. And so basically this is the, the main idea of how now we would use uh, reinforcement learning. And is that first we would make, we would feed it some computer, a computer algorithm, and we would feed it a model such that the the computer basically would play against itself. It said it means it would it would increase uh, its accuracy on a computer. And after that, we would release it to the true system or to the true bioprocess. Uh, so that made it like a very very robust uh, algorithm. And this is the main idea of how we use reinforcement learning for bioprocess optimization. Now, something that might not be obvious, but it's that modeling and optimizing by your process, it's much more difficult to play Go. So there's a lot of hype around playing Go and winning against humans, but actually just optimizing by your process is much more difficult. And this is because one, Go and all of these schemes have actually uh, exact models. And by your process, again, as I mentioned, they're stochastic. And also there's millions of microorganisms yeah, so different types of microorganisms or different strains would behave differently. And also there's millions of process combinations. Uh, and, and again, this is also a continual dynamic system. So while in Go or in chess, for example, you have you have one player goes and then the other, this is a, a dynamic system and this makes it more much difficult. So the main takeaway is that there's still lots of work to be done. We've managed to do a few very nice things, but but there's lots of research here. And again, if, if you like to look at the papers, uh, the, these are the papers where we describe this whole thing where we use reinforcement learning in bioprocesses. So now and I'm, I'm now getting to the finishing part of my talk is that machine learning is super nice. Uh, it has super nice components, a super nice community, and the algorithms are very, very nice. But it will not substitute biological modeling or in, in engineering in general for a quite a long time. However, it can be a very good complement, and this is the, the best way that I think we should use it. So we should use machine learning in combination with the knowledge that we already have right now and that we're using. And well, so that concludes. I just wanted to, to, to thank my friends and collaborators who have uh, helped me develop the work and the work that I've been talking about now. And these are some of the some of the of, of the references that, that I outlined throughout this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk, Antonio. It was really, really interesting. We had a very nice audience that was listening to your talk, and we had some really cool questions. Um, I, I, uh, for this part of the q and I would like to introduce uh, my master student, Alejandro de la Garza. Uh, they have been reading some of the questions on Facebook and they're going to try to compile as much questions as they can and uh, and try to uh, get some answers from Dr. Antonio. Why don't you start with this, Alex? Okay, so hi everyone. Hi, Dr. Antonio. Uh, thank you Hello. again for, for this presentation. It was very interesting. And as the Dr. Ruben say, I have a few questions from the public on Facebook Live. Um, I will start with the first one is, can you suggest a reading list or even a great book to start with these topics? Yeah, so yeah, so so th this is obviously a lot of, uh, I'm just gonna, so it depends on what machine learning technique you wanna start on. I, so if, if I were to say one book, for deep learning, for example, there's what's called the deep learning book. It's free online. Uh, this is a very nice book. Uh, yeah, that will tell you everything that you want to know about deep learning. There's also on Coursera, the website Coursera, deep learning okay. specialization. That's very good also. So th those are the main topics for deep learning. If you wanted to know about machine learning in general, I, I 
again, there's lots of courses and, and many great, great sources. But generally, I point my students into um, in, into one that's um, that's machine learning in Coursera also, and it's given by a, 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 a professor from Stanford called Andrew Ng, who's actually found there of Coursera, and that gives you a very nice overview. Now, um, a bit of, of I mean. This, this sounds like self-promotion, but this is a question that I get asked relatively frequently. And in my in my website from Imperial, I have a tab that's called Learning Material, okay. where I actually outline. So actually, if if you give me a bit of time, I only need like a a few more seconds. I can I can put it maybe on, on my slide. Yeah, sure. Um, let me see. So yeah, this is a question that I get asked, get asked relatively frequently. Um, give me a second just to re-share. So there I have it. So this one at the top. So if, if I'm able to share the screen. So this one at the top, I know it's, it, I know it's a big hyperlink. But basically, my group is just optimization and machine learning for process engineering. If you type that and or my name into Imperial, you'll go to my website, and I have a specific section that says learning materials. And here I outline lots of material for machine learning, like lots of them for optimization, uh, for deep learning specifically. So I, I think here I outline a few sources uh, where people can go through because this is very important. And something that, that I would highlight about this is try to learn also with some some friend that you have or, or a group of friends it makes it much more fun and much more enjoyable and uh and maybe even with a side project uh, but yeah I, I think that's i think that's a super important uh thing to know. so thank you thank you a lot uh, we will write down these links on the description of the video so anyone can reach like easily okay. I have another question from the audience. Uh, so, do you think that machine learning could improve the prediction of uh, the prediction power tools of like flux bio balance analysis problem? Yeah. So I yeah uh, I think so. Yes. So, I mean the the short answer is yes. The the long obviously is there's lots of things that need to happen. Uh, but, but lots of groups are working on it, actually. Uh, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think flux balance and something that machine learning could. And, and again, I think a synergy between them would be very useful, depending what to do exactly. But yeah, so sorry. So yeah, the, the short answer is yes. The, long, the bit longer answer would be a whole, a whole research discussion on it. Yeah. Um, another one is what is the most complicated part of applying machine learning to a biological process? I think the most complex part is that you need to know both of them relatively well. So if someone that doesn't know any bio process tries to apply machine learning, he's not going to be able to do anything. And at the same time, if someone who knows very well biological process but knows very little about machine learning, there's also little he would be able to do. So I think that the main thing is to try to know enough about both of them um, and then apply them. Again, more specific, I, I know this is being very broad, but I don't think there's a more specific answer than, than that. Yeah. OK, uh, another question is, what is the catch about Gaussian model? It sounds too good to be true, requiring low number of, that, of data, and it even gives the errors. So what, ah, what is the tricky part about it? Yeah, this is a super good question, actually. So I didn't have time to go through it, but I should probably include it in the slides. So one thing is that it's very computationally intensive. So I'm, I'm just going to give a, a, a broad number here, but I mean, when you start getting around a thousand data points, it starts getting very, very slow. So to make predictions or optimization in real time is very difficult. So I mean, just, there's many caveats to it, but they, these are the big ones. Computational complexity is one of them. The other is that 
so it does give you an error, an, an uncertainty bound, but obviously this, this uncertainty bound is based on some specific assumptions that you're making. Okay. And that many, I mean, actually most of the times they're not true, but the uncertainty bounds are most of the time not that bad, but they're never perfect. So uh, again, they give you an uncertainty bound. This uncertainty bound is not perfect, but it's also how much you can trust it. Uh, so yeah, there's lots of caveats to it also as well. Okay, uh, maybe you, we're gonna give just another two or three. Uh, they ask, once you have created a specific machine learning based model, would you recommend to test it with uh, multiple machine learning models to validate it? Um, so generally what people do is they, they more yeah, so, so one thing you could do is you could build lots of machine learning models and then try to cross validate between them. Uh, that, that's something that people do and that's not a bad idea. But the other thing that most of the time you want to do is cross validate it against real data. Okay. Something that you should never do is obviously extrapolate a machine learning model. That's also obviously a nice thing about biological models. You can extrapolate them. When you construct a biological model, you know you know enough biology so that you know again the limitations that come with it, and then those limitations are determined not necessarily by the data. I mean, sometimes, but many times by actually you know exactly when the hypotheses that you put inside a model are true. When you do a data-driven model or a machine learning model, only the data is speaking, so you can never extrapolate. Uh, so that's something very important to keep in mind. Okay, thank you a lot. Uh, maybe the last one is, what would you recommend to a biotech undergraduate student who wants to learn about machine learning? Yeah, I, I would, this is a bit of the first question, but what I would say is first, I would learn Python. There's very nice courses online. There's even a course that takes four hours that teaches you the basics. Uh, there's also very lo much longer, which I would recommend. I would recommend doing it with a friend uh, and try a project on the side. And then after a bit of Python, I would go to online courses and try the same scheme. So having a friend that do it with you, do the exercises, the homeworks, and later on little project and maybe even research. So, you know, if you're in university, as long as you want to do this, many, many professors are very happy to take you on. Um, and so you can do actually projects and research projects with them. So that's the way I would start. Started about. Uh, okay, so maybe I think this is the last one. If anyone has another question, uh, remember that uh, the, all the links are in the description, so you can reach out Dr. Antonio and uh, talk about your personal questions. So thank you a lot again, Dr. Antonio, and that was the question part. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thanks. Great, Alex. Thank you very much. So. Um, now we're going to do a small activity we did um, using using uh, an application called Mentimeter. Uh, we have a couple of questions that we want. Um, it's 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 I think two or three questions are multiple choice. We're going to display them here, but please enter on the link on Facebook and see how much you learned about about the talk. You can just select your multiple choice um, answer. And uh, this activity, remember to register on your on our um, on our Google form that was shared at the beginning, and maybe we can share it again, Alex and and Jordi, and uh, so that between all of those participants, we are going to give out twenty scholarships free of charge to get into the Congress, and some other prices that you're going to get on your emails. So please register and uh, let's do this um, this activity before going to the Q&A about the Congress in general. Jordi, can you share the slides and the and the, and the code to get into the in, into the activity? Yes, it's in the comments, the link for the and for enter to the uh, question. OK. 
Okay, so remember to answer the, the in the code that is keeping on the comments. So now we have uh, a few answers. By now there are 12 people that have voted. So, okay. Okay, the first question was, uh, biological systems are, and the answer was stochastic and no chaotic, stochastic, stochastic and chaotic, and no stochastic and chaotic. So a lot of people, uh, by now we are 21. Let's, let's give them a few minutes, uh, uh, one minute. Can you share the slide? Now we're sharing. All right, cool. So let's go to the next question. We got twenty five. Okay, and then the next question is. So what was the correct answer? Okay, Alex. so maybe let Dr. Antonio answer this one. Sorry, I'm, I'm muted. Yeah, yeah, it was the 24, right? Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. So it's stochastic yeah. and chaotic. chaotic. People are paying lots of attention. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a, another one. So that was about uh, one of the models that Dr. Antonio showed us. And that was the, the question. A discrepancy model, where in the equation are you going to use machine learning? Yeah, the so way. in the discrepancy model, that would be, I'm ah, sorry, sorry. I shouldn't have answered right yet. <laughs> no problem. Okay. So okay, what's so, <laughs> Dr. Antonio, can can you tell us a little bit about it again? Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's in the in the discrepancy term is is where you use the 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 machine learning component. Okay. So. The people was paying, putting a lot of attention. Yeah. So well, this was just the two the two questions that that we have prepared. Thank you a lot for all the people who participate. Great. So guys, remember to register to the Google Forms. Um, you have some time to register. Um, in the in the in the next few hours, uh, I think tomorrow morning uh, we will we will get um, some of the lucky participants from the Google Forms um, that register, and we're going to send you an email with your coupon for free attendance to the meeting and some other uh, prizes that we are preparing. So, um, <clears throat> well, I want to thank. Everyone for joining us. We had a great audience today, and we hope we'll see you all at the Congress, at the main event, this coming up 24th of October. Um, also, I don't know if, if anyone has a question about 
about the procedure. Uh, remember that we have several activities for the event. We have eight workshops that you're going to get um, uh, valid certificates for. Um, two, of, two of those eight workshops are given by uh, industry leader Sartorius on bioprocess engineering. And the other six um, workshops are given by great PhDs and professors um, on, their, on different areas and fields. We're going to have between, uh, if we get all of them confirmed, 20 keynote speakers from great universities, great uh, um, leaders, science, uh, leaders and scientists are going to join us for this Congress. We're also going to have um, um, one, one event, which is meet the editor. We're going to have the editor of Frontiers in Synthetic Biology, well, Frontiers in Bioengineering and uh, Biotechnology for the, the, the senior editor and for the uh, synthetic biology and bioprocess section. So um, he's also going to be a keynote speaker. I'm going to have a meet the editor to see what editors are looking for when you submit a journal uh, to, to this kind of journal and to other journals, how to write your paper, et cetera. So it's going to be really, really cool. And you're going to have to get an interaction with, with him. And also one of our previous uh, our third pre uh, previous uh, activity, we're going to have the editor, uh, um, the uh, associate editor of Transactional Nanobioscience, a professor who is a leader in the field of nanotechnology. Um, we'll give you his name later. Um, be, uh, keep, it, keep in touch with us so you can uh, be part of the third activity. And um, we also have abstract submission, which is due this 1st of October but we are planning to give you a, a one more week of extension. So, uh, and remember that the first 75 uh, abstracts that we get um, and, and are accepted, we're go are going to get a full scholarship to the event. I don't know if I'm from forgetting anything else, Jordi and Alex and Julieta. Are there any questions? There is a question from the public that says, when will the full list of of speakers be published? So um, we are going to have this, I think within the next week, we're going to have um, all of the, most of the speakers. We have a couple that haven't, um, that are unsure because of classes, um, uh, but we're going to have at least 90% of all of the speakers up uh, by the end of this week. And then we're going to have a couple of more hopefully um, be um, released within the next two weeks, probably. Okay, thank you. I think this uh, and everything for the comments. Okay, cool. So thanks so much for participating. Thank you, Dr. Antonio, for such a great talk and for participating with us. It was great having you. Um, thank you all, thank you, thanks a lot. And I think your, your talk was a great success. Um, we saw it that they were that they were paying attention. They were, those were not yes. easy questions, huh? I know. Yeah, they weren't as yeah. I thought they were gonna be easier. <laughs> All right. So thanks. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Soon. Bye. See you Bye. soon. Bye.